بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله الكريم الحمد لله and welcome back to another episode of Life's Adornments where we're discussing the virtues of child rearing, its benefits, its trials and tribulations and how do we return back to the Quran and Sunnah with regards to raising our children in an Islamic manner. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we last talked about um, the causes of deviation for children and we wanted to go a bit deeper into this topic today and talk about some more subtle things that may happen inside of the home that cause children to go astray. We know that every parent's wish is to see their child on Sirat al Mustaqim, on the straight path, to be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to worship Allah, and to follow in the footsteps of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. But oftentimes, this isn't always the case. So, what do we do in these matters? How can we defend it? How can we block these matters? And how can we protect? our household. To help us with these matters, we have Sheikh Asim Luqman Al-Hakim, who is a teacher at Zad Academy and KIU, and an imam and teacher for over 30 years. We would like to introduce and welcome our guests. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Now, Sheikh, it's always a pleasure to have you, mashallah. Jazakallah khair, the pleasure is all mine. All right, as is our tradition, let's get directly into the matter. The first thing at hand is conflicts within the home. And this oftentimes leads to divorce or, or not. But how does conflict within the home, the tribulations that happen, how does that affect the, the child and cause them in certain cases to go astray? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa alihi wa sahbih, wa ma nehtada bi hudahu amma ba'd. Everyone knows that the environment affects you, whether positively or negatively. And the term that we often say and hear a lot is, I'm not in a good mood. Mm -hmm. So what helps in changing your mood? Definitely there are a number of factors. Among the greatest of them is your upbringing. And this is why we focus a lot upon the parents, because they can make or break a child. We know that marital disputes in the household is a normal thing. It's like the spices you put on the food. Mm -hmm. If it's too much, it's going to spoil it. And if it, there's no spices at all, you look for it somewhere else. Change the restaurant, for example. May God forbid. Mm -hmm. So what happens when a couple fight in front of their children, they display what the child is going to be in the future. And this is cascaded to anyone who is a role model. So if you have a teacher who's arrogant, who's abusive, this would have a negative impact on the student. If you have um, the couples, the father, the parents, who are like this, that will impact your child. And if you have an imam of the masjid, if you have a scholar, mm -hmm. and this is one of the biggest problems you have in today's times, when a scholar who is knowledgeable, who is highly decorated, unfortunately, he does not walk the talk. Yeah. He's arrogant, he's abusive, he ridicules people, he even backbites others on the account that this is jarh wa ta'deel. And this is what the man Hajj says we have to do. Well, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. Would the Prophet do such things? Yes, yes, yes. So, no, the Salaf say that you have to be uh, uh, tough and rough and rigid with the people of innovation. People of innovation differ. There are different levels and some of them have misinterpreted and not intentionally diverted from the Salat al-Mustaqim, from the straight path. So you have to treat them differently, not brush them with the, uh, or paint them with the same brush and consider them all halal for you to backbite and slander and, and, and make fun of. So the children are vulnerable and you mold them as you wish in a household where the parents can communicate even when angry and the child is watching the father is not hitting the mother mm -hmm. 
He's not cursing her. He's not saying offensive words. The mother is not shouting at him or throwing things at him. Rather, they are disputing. They have an argument. They have different of opinions, but it is civilized. This is how your child is going to grow up. But if it's the other way around, and unfortunately we have lots of examples, not only in the Muslim world, in even domestic violence is a big issue worldwide. So many women talk to me about domestic uh, uh, violence, and I tell them that such marriage is not a healthy one. What are you waiting for? Mm -hmm. Until he kills you? If he punches you, if he strangles you, if he uh, 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 makes or puts bruises on your body, what, what, what is next? So you have to do something. And then the first thing you do usually is get a medical report so that this is a legal document. And a lot of the men, unfortunately, don't fear Allah. Rather, they fear the police no. and being prosecuted for domestic violence. And this is a serious offense almost everywhere. So they have to do something about it. The most important thing is not to have these fights in front of the children. And you can see how it reflects when a child starts to physically abuse his siblings, younger or, or, or older, because now he is becoming trained and he has a role model to follow. And this is all because of the mistakes that are beyond repair in some cases of the parents. Uh, I once came across a narration from about Aisha radiallahu anha, our mother, where um, she would say, وَرَبُّ Ibrahim" in certain cases. Yes. Uh, and this, the Prophet ﷺ told her that I know when you're upset at me Correct. because you swear by the Lord of Ibrahim, and when you're happy with me, you swear by the Lord of Muhammad. True. So it makes me think to myself, when I was younger, I never really saw my parents argue or Mashallah. have conflicts. Mashallah. So when I got married and older, and I came into conflicts, which is normal. I was like, wait a minute, this happens, and I didn't really know directly how to handle it. So I think, is, is, would it be true that perhaps if conflicts were in front of the children, but handled in a respectable and Islamic manner, could this then strengthen them in the future and teach them how do you deal with discord and conflicts? Well, we have three scenarios. One, abusive parents mm -hmm. having arguments that is physical or unhealthy. Yes. This would definitely <coughs> reflect on the child in a negative way. Then we have the second scenario where they have conflicts, but they don't express it. It's all behind closed doors. This would definitely not impact the children negatively, but at the same time, it depends on the upbringing of the child mm -hmm. and how Allah Azza wa guides him or not. Mm -hmm. So usually it has no negative nor positive impact. And then we have the third scenario where they do argue but in a civil way and at the end of the day they kiss and make up mm -hmm. and the children have a happy ending yes. and this shows them that whenever you communicate with others then this would uh, have a positive result inshallah this would most likely not always but most likely would have a positive impact on them yeah so how how they learn and debate how they see their parents is their first way to interpret how to deal with conflict, but in, in these abusive situations, you recommend what, the, what it needs to be done? Because many times in our masajid, you see a sister will be abused by her husband, and she'll come to the imam and, and these different people, but it's like a sticky situation. So how do you recommend this be handled? There's nothing sticky yeah. about it. First of all, we have a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. We have a, uh, uh, a chain of command. So first of all, the sister, and we will assume that she is the weakest link and that she's the one who's being oppressed because I have <laughs> unfortunately uh, uh, counseled men who are being beaten up by their yeah, this is wives reality, yes. and some of them for a few years now and is patiently waiting for a solution and the brother calls me and says what to do. This is true, yes. He has the physical ability to retaliate but you will always be under the microscope, you'll always be the aggressor even if you do it in self-defense. Nobody believes it. Mm -hmm. So, assuming that the woman is 
under attack, in this case, she has to communicate with her husband when he's in a good mood. If this doesn't work, he's always on the edge and he's just waiting to burst, then she has to talk, if it's possible, with him to a marriage counselor, a Muslim marriage counselor who would listen to both of them and pinpoint the mistakes. Most men would not like this because they know they're, yeah. it's their fault. Then she has to go and address this to her parents and her siblings. They have to stand by her side and show him, okay, you wanna pick a fight? Pick a man your size and don't show your strength to a poor woman. When he sees that there are men who are ready to beat the heck out of him, mm -hmm. then he would realize that, okay, let me consider this twice. Because most of such so-called rage is selective, it's not real. Mm. So he has, or he justifies what he had done because I have rage issues, I apologize to my wife. Okay, subhanAllah, when a police officer stops you, gives you a ticket, and maybe insults you, would you have these rage attacks against him? He said, no, he'll put me in prison. What about if um, your boss, who's got the authority to sign your increment and bonus and raise, if he insults you, would you retaliate with a rage fit? He said, no, of course not, I can't. What about if someone says something to anger you or gives you the gesture of a finger or two or whatever on road and you want to express your rage and you want to fight with him but you discover that he's six four uh, uh, from brussels full of muscles Bismillah, mashallah. so <laughs> what are you going to do he said i'm going to kiss his knees this is the high as i reach he said okay subhanallah this means your, your rage is selective you choose to abuse your wife because you're a person who does not fear Allah Azza wa mm. Not because you have rage problems. So such people, you have to stop them. Yes. Sometimes logic is not good enough. So you have to obtain medical reports and tell them I'll ta I'm taking you to court tomorrow. And then they'll throw your backside in, in jail for a long time. Then he will stop. Or intimidate him with your father and siblings. Let them talk to him man to man and tell him, that we don't accept this. You took our daughter from our house in honor and we trusted you. You should not do what you're doing. Maybe this would help. Uh, we're going to pause here, inshallah, for a short break. And we'll come right back to continue with the causes of deviation for children. Stay tuned with us until you get back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to our second segment of Life's Adornments where we are discussing the causes of a child's or children the deviation. Alhamdulillah, we last talked about um, conflict within the household and how that then affects the growing up of a child and causes them to go outside. So this is an issue where many times children have issues within the household, conflicts within the household, and then it causes them to leave outside and learn in the streets, as we say in America, the school of hard knocks. So you learn upbringing, you learn about yourself, your identity, and how to behave from the streets as opposed to learning from the household, and then you pick up bad companionship. So we want to talk to Sheikh Asim about how does bad companionship affect the tarbiyah, the upbringing of a child? Well, the Prophet والسلام, clearly explained this to us when he gave us the similitude, the comparison between a good companion and a bad companion. No. So the Prophet told us that a good companion <coughs> is like a person who sells perfumes and musk. So if I know such a person, just being in touch with him, he would either sell me something that is good in, in, in fragrance, mm -hmm. or he would give me as a sample that would, oh, uh, s smells good, 
or the least is just by going to his shop, I'll catch some of the perfumes in my clothes. So a good companion is like that. You sit with a good companion, he would remind you of an ayah, of a hadith, of a nice incident. He would see something that is wrong and say, Akhi, this is wrong, what you're doing is haram, or you should do this, or why not go with me to the masjid and pray? How about a umrah? Imagine if you say, subhanallah, wa bihamdi a hundred times, Allah would forgive all of your sins. So many things you can benefit from a good companion. The least is that he would have your back. Mm -hmm. If someone back bites you, he would defend you. If someone wants to harm you, he would stand by you. Now a bad companion is totally the opposite. He's like a man working in the bellows. So he is a blacksmith working with iron and coal and fire. If you go to his shop, maybe some of the sparks would burn your clothes. Mm -hmm. And if nothing harms you or burns you, the least is that your clothes, your beard, your hair would smell awful. So this is a bad companion. It's bad news. Nowadays, our lives are negatively impacted by the bad companions. Mm -hmm. Those who we ride with, who we hang out with. I know a friend who picked up smoking and are at an early age. So I asked him, how could that be? He said, my father was an influential man who was busy all the time. My mom was not educated, so she only worked in the house for uh, 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 securing uh, our food and clothes and, you know, normal house chores. Mm -hmm. So whenever I wanted to communicate with any one of them, they would give me money and say, go out, buy something from the grocery shop. So I used to hang out on the streets for six or seven hours doing nothing. So I met others who were like me, and alhamdulillah, it was only limited to smoking cigarettes. Mm. We, there was no weed or, or any something that is more awful than those cigarettes. Smoking is haram, but it is compared today, it's, whoa, mashallah, he's a righteous person. He only smokes. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, there are so many things that have deteriorated in the communities, but it starts with smoking. So he said, I was 12 years of age and I picked up smoking at that early age. Subhanallah, the guy prays in the masjid and he's okay, but he picked this habit, which is now almost impossible to kick because he was raised doing it. And this is one aspect. Now, in school, you fall under what is known as peer pressure. Mm -hmm. So yes, you're straight. You're a good guy. You pray in the masjid. And you end up by so many people asking you all the time, do you have a girlfriend? No, I don't. Are you gay? No. Then why don't you have a girlfriend? A lot of the people who fall under this peer pressure if not, they, if they do not look for a real girlfriend, they make up stories and they live in fantasies and they lie. So they tell their peers, yeah, I have one, I have two. We've been to the movie, we, I took her to the uh, um, a drive-in and we saw a beautiful movie. We went there and we went, did this, did that, all lies. Akhi, you're a good Muslim, why are you doing this? He said, Wallahi, they've been pressuring me and they almost accuse me of being gay. So you lie? He says, lying is better than doing the right thing. The, 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 the opposite, which is taking a girlfriend. I know of a friend who is, used to talk to me about his past. He says, when I was 16, 17 years of age, I used to pray five prayers in the masjid. But I had friends, I wasn't a practicing Muslim, 
I just prayed. I had friends that I hung up, out with every single night. And whenever it was Maghrib time, I would stand up and say, you know, play cards, do whatever. I would stand up and say, okay, it's Maghrib time, I'm going to pray. The five or six friends of his would mock him and make fun of him. And they say, oh, Sheikh, oh, Imam, make dua for us. And they laugh. So he went the first day, the second day, the third day, he fell under the peer pressure and he skipped Maghrib prayer. Mm -hmm. Why? Because this is the influence of bad company. And again, we always use the same hadith of the Prophet ﷺ when he told us about the murderer who killed a hundred soul. And the scholar told him, you live in an environment that helps you do that. You have to leave them, migrate to another city where, or a town where there are righteous practicing people, you worship Allah with them. The environment affects you. And do not listen to the whispers of shaitan. Because sometimes shaitan comes to me and says, MashaAllah, <coughs> you're a practicing sheikh. Why don't you mix with actors and actresses and, and celebrities and enjoy your time and give them da'wah? You have knowledge. You have I said, hey, hey, play another game, mm -hmm. not me. If you bring a good, healthy red apple and you put it in a rotten box of apples, will it fix them? Spoils it. They will spoil it mm -hmm. and make it decay. So your heart is also vulnerable to such attacks. The children are in great need of good company. And by the way, it's not only the streets. It is the international schools you put your children in. I am shocked when I go and see Muslim families putting their children in international schools. Hmm. Okay, no problem. Why are you doing this? Said, we want them to learn English. But you're Arabs, you're Muslims. People from America, people from Europe, wish they pay, spend all of their wealth just to learn Arabic and to teach it to their children. While you are doing the opposite. What is this? They say, well, English is the language of the millennium. The, the English is this, is English is that. Okay, what about their Islamic education? Zero. Their knowledge of the Quran? Zero. Their knowledge of Aqeedah. Some of the children who are 15 or 16, 16 years of age, you ask them, what are the pillars of Islam? They make mistakes. What are the six pillars of Iman? They don't even know what is Al-Qadr, the predestiny, and how to think about it. What kind of Islam is this? So negative influence coming from bad company is not limited only to the thugs on the streets. It can be self-imposed. Mm -hmm. When you take your children, when you make your children under the influence that the Western civilization is sophisticated, is something that is cool, and you're nothing without it occupying your thoughts and life and acting like them and being like them. So this is one aspect, again, of bad company. Yeah, it, it reminded me of um, a sort of a situation I had when I was growing up, which is that I had a sort of a, a strong personality growing up and I wasn't overly practicing, but I just had like a system that I knew there were certain things I just wouldn't enter in. And even, and I had really bad company around me. So I would come and hang with the guys that were on the corner selling drugs and doing things. But when I would come around, they would like hide the drugs, and, sure. you know, <laughs> and do this way. And I always thought it was fine until one day there was one of our friends who he was driving and there were some guys who had just robbed the bank and they asked him for a ride home. So the police stopped them and they gave him 20 years for being an accessory. So when I told my father what happened, he said, yes, this is why Allah taught, taught us don't even come close because Correct. sometimes just by being in an environment when Allah punishes people, if you're present, you're gonna receive a bit of that as well. The company is important not only to our children, it is important to us 
Imagine in Surah Al-Kahf, which Muslims read every single Friday. Allah Azza wa Jal is addressing the Prophet mm. by saying, Wasbir nafsak. Mm. You have to force yourself to be among those who remember Allah Azza wa Jal day and night, seeking His face, seeking His pleasure. And do not look left, right or center to others. And do not obey those whom we have made their hearts neglectful and hideous. Mm. So if this is said to the Prophet mm. wow. then by default we are in greater need of that. Uh, with that being said, we're going to end our program today, inshallah. Thank you so much for your wisdom and sharing your great knowledge with us, inshallah. Jazakum uh, For the viewers, we hope that you benefited much, inshallah. Uh, stay tuned for another episode of Life's Adornments. Until next time, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mm -hmm.